Hello and welcome to the Digital Orphanage. This episode, we continue with part 3 of our Amiga 2000 series. In parts 1 and 2, we looked at two Amiga 2000 computers from the Museum of Computing in Swindon, and then refurbished the power supplies. In part 3, we repair the motherboard from the first of those Amiga 2000s. As soon as I found these computers in the museum store, I removed the covers. Not just to discover what expansion cards they contained, but also to check for damage from leaking batteries. Not only were the original batteries still on the motherboards, unfortunately they had leaked. With a pair of snips, I removed the source of so many faulty motherboards before they could do more harm. And now the time has come to see what damage has been caused. So it's over to the bench again. The corrosion where the battery was appears to be reasonably localised, although it has spread as far as the keyboard socket, and some of the circuit traces look broken. We've also got signs that something treated this as its home. Spiders perhaps? Maybe no perhaps about it. There are also many old electrolytic capacitors that should really be replaced. Liberating the motherboard requires the removal of five screws. Three of them are obvious, but two of them are not so. Being the right hand screw of the disk drive and the left joystick port. Finally there are seven standoffs that need to be gently pinched to free the board. With all the cables disconnected, the board can be tilted up at the front and lifted out of the case. The dual inline ICs are easily removed with a flat blade screwdriver. I use a careful twisting rather than a levering motion. Alternating ends, ensuring an even lift to not bend pins. Removing all the socketed ICs is important. It keeps them out of harm's way while I work on the motherboard and allows the sockets themselves to be inspected. The Motorola 68000 CPU is the first to be liberated. A pin nearest the battery shows signs of corrosion. The other type of socketed IC is the Agnes chip, here in PLCC packaging. To remove this type you need a PLCC extraction tool which lifts the chip from underneath at opposite corners. Normally all that is needed is a simple squeeze and lift motion to free Agnes from her socket. But this Agnes did not feel like getting up and steadfastly removed to budge from her bed. Perhaps over 30 years of oxidation has had something to do with it. Unfortunately the extraction tool slipped and caused damage to a corner of Agnes so it was time to find a different method of removal. And what better way to turn Agnes out of her bed than to turn the bed upside down and hit it with a hammer. Underneath Agnes, the board designer has provided two holes. With a flat rod and the cutest hammer I have, I use gentle taps to persuade Agnes to get up. The glistening is from switch cleaner I sprayed on Agnes's contacts to try and free them up. You can see the small corner missing and the light scratch caused by the tool slipping. Hopefully only cosmetic damage. The pins don't look corroded though, which is good. And the socket is undamaged, but some pins do look a little dull. Next to be removed are all the electrolytic capacitors. As with the power supply, I couldn't find a layout diagram, so need to make my own, noting position, polarity and values. I also remove all the labels, as I intend to clean the board, and that might damage them. Remember this is a restoration, not just getting the computer to work. All of these labels help to tell the computer's story. With the capacitor layout now colour-coded, and an order for new capacitors placed, it's time to remove the old. A desolder tool is well worth the investment. 
I check each remove capacitor against my diagram. 32 in total. With the board now looking a lot bearer, it's time to tackle the battery corrosion. The clean patches underneath the sockets give a glimpse of how the board would have looked when new. I have a range of small brushes for cleaning, from very soft plastic through glass fibre to brass and steel wire. Using the softest, I remove most of the fluff and spider deposits. Then some distilled malt vinegar is sprayed onto the corroded areas and worked in with a gentle brushing. Some of the more stubborn deposits and rust on the metalwork require the brass brush to remove. Next is a gentle bath in hot water with a dissolved dishwasher tablet. One day it would be nice to own a large ultrasonic bath to clean these boards thoroughly. I've seen people use dishwashers to clean boards but that feels too harsh and unpredictable. For now, this method will suffice. A narrow hair dye brush is ideal for cleaning the slots and not forgetting the underneath of the board. The board looks positively sparkling and you can see just how dirty it was from the colour of the water. Next I rinse the board thoroughly with warm water and shake the excess away. Then the board is sprayed down with IPA and left to drain, while I switch on the electric fan oven to a low temperature and let it warm up. With the board placed in the fan oven for half an hour or so, what better way to pass the time than to start reading my Commodore, the inside story book. David gave a talk at the last Southwest Amiga Group event in what now feels like the faraway land of January 2020. With the board now dry, it's back to the bench to do detailing, as some areas need further work. I use switch cleaner and a soft brush to shine up the IC socket contacts. Gentle scraping with a scalpel cleans up the circuit traces that were corroded. The area is further cleaned with hot flux and copper braid. Thankfully, circuit traces that earlier looked broken now look like they might just be okay. A multimeter set to continuity mode provides reassurance that we have indeed been lucky. The socket nearest the corrosion is also checked. It would be a crime to put dirty chips back into a clean motherboard, so the whole Amiga chipset family has some pampering with IPA, and careful use of the scalpel is needed again to clean the corroded pin. I have enough capacitors here for three boards, as I plan to work on my own A1500 at some point. It's at this point you'll be thankful for the time spent creating a detailed layout diagram. The holes are spaced slightly wider than the smaller capacitors Commodore used, and indeed my replacements, so the leads need to be pre-bent. As per best practice, the leads are cut before soldering. I do one at a time, as it helps to ensure the capacitor doesn't fall out. With another 31 to go, I'm glad I made the solder fume extractor. I double check the capacitors to ensure I haven't made a mistake. And any flux residue is removed. Before any chips are installed, I power the motherboard up. Nothing goes pop and all the voltages on the sockets look to be okay. With the motherboard powered off again, it's time to settle the chips back into their spring cleaned home. I'm pleased with how the board now looks. The corrosion has been cleaned up and any traces of prior inhabitants now gone. A worthwhile addition to your Amiga toolkit is Diagram by John Hartel. It temporarily replaces the Kickstart ROM and provides low level test functions. Such as memory tests, along with video and audio tests. A thermal view of the motherboard from my thermal camera shows nothing to be concerned about. In the foreground is the CPU with Agnes behind it, and Paula and Denise at the back. 
Paula on the right seems to produce more heat than Denise on the left. With the kickstart ROM refitted, there are a few finishing touches to make. The first is to solder a couple of pin headers so I can locate a new battery away from the motherboard. The white tack putty holds them in place during soldering. I clean the previously corroded areas with IPA one last time. Before coating the area with a solder mask to prevent further corrosion. It's painted on and cured with a UV light. Which of course is more fun used in the dark. Not a perfect colour match by any means, but better than leaving it exposed. The last task is to place all the original labels back where they were originally. The revision label needs a new sticky back though. One refurbished Amiga 2000 motherboard. Hopefully good for many years to come. And what better way to give it a thorough shakedown than my favourite Amiga demo of all time. The 1993 classic Nine Fingers by Spaceballs. In the next Amiga 2000 episode, we'll be bringing together all the components of the first of the Amiga 2000s. We may even get to see if there's something interesting on the hard disk, if it still works. Until then, take care and goodbye. Let me see your identification. We don't need to see his identification. Follow me.